this video I will be covering Unit 2 of AS Chemistry and in particular I will be looking at inorganic chemistry of Group 7 limited to chlorine, bromine and iodine. First we need to discuss the appearance of each halogen and also we need to know what their solutions in both water and in hydrocarbon solvents look like. First of all, halogens are found in Group 7 on the right hand side of the periodic table next to the noble gases. They are non-metals. They exist as separate diatomic molecules, such as Cl2, Br2, and I2. And they all have the electronic configuration of Ns2, Np5. And this is confirmed by the fact that they are located in the P block of the periodic table. Chlorine is a gas at standard room temperature and pressure and it is green or pale yellow. When chlorine is dissolved in water it gives a pale yellow pale green solution and the same when it is dissolved in a hydrocarbon solvent. Bromine is a red-brown liquid as shown here. It is very volatile which gives a red-brown gas. It is partially soluble in water and, is, and it's very soluble in a hydrocarbon solvent and the solution is red-brown for both water and a hydrocarbon solvent. Iodine, as shown here, is a solid and it is grey. It sublimes on heating to give a purple gas. It is slightly soluble in water, giving a pale yellow solution and iodine is very soluble in a hydrocarbon solvent, giving a pink or red solution. As we go from chlorine to bromine to iodine, we are increasing the number of electrons. Therefore, we are increasing the London forces. This is why iodine, which has 106 electrons, is solid, whereas chlorine, which only has 34 electrons, is a gas. The halogens are oxidizing agents, and the strength decreases down the group. It's important to remember that a halogen can oxidize other halide ions if the halide is below it in the group. Because chlorine is higher than both bromine and iodine, it can oxidize both of these, as shown here, where we have chlorine reacting with bromide ions. The bromide ions are oxidized to bromine gas, and the same happens with the iodide ions where they are oxidized to iodine, and this is because both bromine and iodine are below chlorine in the group. Bromine water can oxidize iodide ions to iodine because iodine is lower down in the group than bromine. And this is the equation for the oxidation of iodide ions to iodine. Halogens can oxidize both metals and non-metals. For example, when chlorine gas reacts with solid iron, we get iron chloride forming, which is a solid. Chlorine gas can also react with phosphorus, which is solid, to produce PCl3, which is a liquid. And if the chlorine is in excess, phosphorus pentachloride can also form. As per this equation, chlorine also oxidizes iron 2 to iron 3, causing a pale green solution to turn brown. And this is the equation. As we go down the group, oxidizing power decreases. Chlorine reacts with water to produce hydrochloric acid and HOCl. If we look at the oxidation number of chlorine, we start off with zero because it is in its elemental state. In HCl chlorine has an oxidation number of minus one and in HOCl the oxidation number of chlorine is plus one. Therefore chlorine in this reaction has both been oxidized and reduced. Therefore this is a disproportionation reaction. Chlorine also reacts with cold aqueous sodium hydroxide to produce sodium chloride, NaOCl, and water. And we can see we start off with chlorine again where the oxidation number is zero. In NaCl the oxidation number is minus one and here the oxidation number is plus one. 
and this is with cold aqueous sodium hydroxide. We can use a hot concentrated potassium hydroxide as shown in this equation. Solid iodine forms a mixture of potassium iodate 5 and potassium iodide. And in this case, notice how the iodine increases its oxidation number by 5 units from 0 in I2 to iodate 5 and decreases by 1 unit from 0 in iodine to iodide. So the reduction has to happen 5 times to balance the electrons. We also need to know how to test for the halide ions. So first we need to make a solution of the halide. We then need to acidify this with dilute nitric acid and this is to prevent the precipitate of other salts forming. We then need to add a few drops of silver nitrate solution. If we have a halide ion present, we can see from this picture here, if we have a white precipitate, it will be a chloride ion. If the precipitate is cream, we will have a bromide ion. And if we have a yellow precipitate, we will have an iodide ion. It's very hard to tell these apart, so we can carry out a secondary test where we treat any precipitate with dilute ammonia solution. And this means that if we have a chloride ion, it will the precipitate will dissolve in dilute ammonia. And if, if, if it doesn't dissolve, we can then treat it with concentrated ammonia. If it's a bromide ion, it will be soluble and concentrated and iodide ions will be insoluble in both dilute and concentrated ammonia solution. This is the general formula for this precipitation reaction. There is also an alternative test when testing for halide ions. In, in, in this case we would add concentrated sulfuric acid very carefully to the solid halide to produce a hydrogen halide. And the sulfuric acid will displace the weaker acids such as hydrochloric, HBr or HI from their salts as they become more powerful reducing agents down the group. Therefore they can react further by reducing the sulfuric acid to a lower oxidation state of sulfur. The general trend in the strength of halide ions as reducing agents as shown here. In this first reaction we have potassium chloride reacting with sulfuric acid to produce HCl, which is the misty steamy fumes, which we can see in the test tube. If we have potassium bromide reacting with sulfuric acid, hydrogen bromide will be produced, which again creates misty fumes. But the hydrogen bromide is then oxidized by the sulfuric acid to bromine. A further step is when sulfuric acid is reduced to, and if we have potassium iodide reacting with sulfuric acid, hydrogen iodide will form. It will immediately oxidize to iodine. The sulfuric acid will be reduced to hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell. Sul sulfur, which is the yellow solid, would also form, and we will have sulfur dioxide forming, which is a colorless gas. We also need to talk about the reactions of hydrogen halides. At standard room temperature and pressure, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide are all colorless gases and they will fume in moist air. All three are extremely soluble in water and form acidic solutions. All three react with ammonia to form a white smoke of the corresponding ammonium halide. To make hydrogen chloride, we take sodium chloride with concentrated sulfuric acid and we get hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide have to be made from a potassium salt with phosphoric acid because it is not such a strong oxidizing agent as sulfuric acid. And this is the reaction between ammonia and a hydrogen halide to produce the corresponding ammonium halide, in which case you could have the ammonium chloride, ammonium bromide or ammonium iodide.
given the trends in physical and chemical properties of chlorine, bromine and iodine, we should be able to predict the properties of fluorine and astatine and their compounds. As we go down the group, the halogens get less reactive. So fluorine, which is at the top, will react just about everything. And astatine, which is right at the bottom, is less reactive than iodine. Fluorine should be a gas and astatine should be a solid and this is because an increase in the number of electrons increases the strength of the London forces. Similarly, astatine will have the highest boiling temperature in group 7. Electronegativity decreases down the group so astatine will have a low electronegativity value and fluorine is the most electronegative element. Fluorine will also be the most oxidizing. Compounds of fluorine and astatine with hydrogen should be soluble in water and forming acids. Bond enthalpies for carbon halogen bonds decrease down the group. Therefore, fluorocarbon compounds should be the most stable and statocarbon compounds will be the least stable. Let's consider the uses of halogen and halides. So chlorine is used in water purification, it's used in bleach, solvents, and also as a polymer, for example, polychloroethene. Fluorine is also used in polymers, so for example, tetrafluoroethene, and it's used in non-stick non -stick frying pans, also in electrical insulation and waterproofing of clothing. Fluoride helps to prevent tooth decay, therefore is used in toothpaste. And we can also add sodium fluoride to water supplies. Hydrogen fluoride is used to edge glass, such as shown here. And silver bromide is used in photographic film. We can use a titration to find the concentration of iodine solution. If we titrate the iodine solution with sodium thiosulfate, of a known concentration, we can find out the concentration of the iodine solution. The reaction between iodine and thiosulfate is a redox reaction and this is because iodine, as shown here, is reduced to iodide ions and thiosulfate is oxidized. Iodine is a weak oxidizing agent and as we know oxidizing agents themselves have to be reduced. So this is the ionic half equation for the reduction of iodine and the electrons have to be on the left as shown here and it's balanced. In this case we have thiosulfate being oxidized. Thio is where we replace an oxygen with the sulfur. So we have we are going from two sulfurs to four sulfurs and from three oxygens to six oxygens. So this is the overall equation. This reaction can be used to work out the concentration of any oxidizing agent that will react with iodide ions to form iodine. And this includes potassium iodate 5. We would use a known volume of the oxidizing agent, for example potassium iodate 5, and we then reacted with iodide ions in excess potassium iodine solution to liberate iodine. The potassium iodide is in excess so that all of the iodate 5 will react and this is shown here. The iodine that is formed is titrated with sodium thiosulfate and the color change in this titration is yellow to colorless. To increase the accuracy we can add a starch indicator just before the endpoint. The blue-black color of starch will disappear at the endpoint showing that all the iodine has just been reacted. We have to remember that if we add starch too early the blue-black color will stay because it will form an iodine starch complex which means that not all of the iodine is titrated and this would reduce the accuracy of the titer. We also need to know how to prepare potassium iodate 5 First, we would calculate 
the amount of iodine needed, for example, to react with 10 cubic centimeters of 4 molar potassium hydroxide solution, in which case we would need 5.12 grams of iodine. We would add the iodine until the color was just visible. We would then take further drops of potassium hydroxide solution and we would add it until the brown color turns very pale yellow. Crystals will form by precipitation from the hot solution. We then let the solution cool, which allows the potassium iodate 5 crystals to come out and they form before potassium iodide because it is much less volatile in cold water. And the sample that we have is impure. We then collect the potassium iodate 5 by suction filtration, which is shown here, and we then dry it between filter papers and this is what the potassium iodate crystals would look like. We also need to remember the details of how to make up a standard solution of known mass of impure potassium iodate 5. We first take a weighing bottle with the lid and we weigh the empty bottle. We then add about 0 0.5 grams of impure potassium iodate 5 and then we re-weigh the bottle. We tip the sample through a funnel into the volumetric flask, as shown here. We rinse the weighing bottle with the water and pour the rinsing through the funnel back into the volumetric flask. We then make up the flask to the 100 cubic centimeters graduation mark, which is here. We put the lid on and carefully invert the flask a number of times. We then can use a pipette and transfer 10 centimeters of the solution into a 100 cubic centimeters conical flask, which allows us to titrate the iodine formed with sodium thiosulfate, which then allows us to calculate the concentration of iodine solution, hence the percentage purity of the sample. In this question, we are asked to find the concentration of iodine when 25 cubic centimeters of the solution was titrated with 0 0.1 molar sodium thiosulfate solution and 18.8 .8 cubic centimeters of sodium thiosulfate was required to reach the endpoint. And we are asked to find the concentration of iodine in grams per decimeter cubed. So first of all, we are given this equation and we would begin by calculating the number of moles of volume is given in cubic centimeters. We need to remember to divide it by a thousand to get it into decimeters cubed, multiply it by the concentration, which gives us 1.88 times 10 to the minus three. From the equation, that is written here, we only need half as much iodine as sodium thiosulfate. So we have one, two. So the ratio is one to two. Therefore, we need to divide this number by two, get the moles of iodine, which will give us 9.4 times 10 to the minus 4 and this is the moles in 25 cubic centimeters of solution. In step 3 we now know the moles of iodine and we also know the volume. We can therefore now find out the concentration. This gives us the concentration in moles per decimeter cube where we asked to find the concentration in grams. And in order to do that, we need to multiply the concentration in the in these units, so 0 0.0376 times the molar mass. And we're given I has 127, but because iodine is a diatomic molecule, it's 127 times 2, which gives us... And this is the concentration of the iodine solution.